now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. One of the most important keys to rightly interpreting scripture is understanding your passage in its context. Context is king. That means knowing what comes before and after your text. And this verse is no different. We're in 1 Timothy 1, 17. And this verse could stand alone as a verse we use to meditate on God's attributes and then praise him accordingly. But what makes this verse really come alive is the context in which the Apostle Paul delivers it to us. That's because he has just been telling us about his conversion. He was reminiscing with Timothy about how he had previously been a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a violent aggressor against Jesus and his people. But he goes on to say that he was shown mercy and that God's grace to him was more than abundant. As he continues to reflect, he makes the statement that Jesus has come to save sinners. And among all sinners, Paul tells us, shockingly, that he is the foremost sinner, the worst sinner. He says if there were titles given out to sinners, he would be the sinner in chief. But God, he explains, used his extreme sinfulness to be an example to everyone who thinks they are too bad to be saved. If God can save me, he can save anyone. That's Paul's logic. And let me just stop there for a second and tell you that there's nothing that you've done that can stop God's love for you and his willingness to save you. And then after he says this, you can almost feel a pause here. Paul cannot go on. He's now flooded with a wave of emotions. We find out as we read his writings that this happened to Paul a lot. As he thought about God's goodness towards him, he responds with this mighty burst of praise. J. Vern McGee puts it this way. Paul simply couldn't go any further without sounding out this tremendous doxology. And commentator David Guzik says this, Paul could not think of how bad he was and how great the salvation of God was and how great the love of God was without simply breaking into spontaneous praise. We should do the same, by the way, as we think about God's goodness. It should lead us to thankfulness and praise. Now, with that as the backdrop, let's look at this verse again. And we're going to pull out some of its key elements. It says, now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So let's look at now to the king eternal. A way to understand this title of God is king of the ages. God is the king of all the ages. Throughout every age of history, God has been there. And in our lives, in every season, from early childhood to old age, good times, bad times, God is with us. He is a solid rock, somebody who we can lean on and trust. No matter what season you're in right now, God is right there. He hasn't changed, and he's with you and for you. Then it says he is immortal. What this is speaking to is that God is incorruptible and imperishable. In other words, if we think about this world, we see things are constantly degrading, constantly aging. This includes you and me, right? But God isn't like that. He is always new, always vibrant, always strong. And he's as strong now as he was billions of years ago and he'll continue to be so forever and ever by the way when we get our new body someday that's going to be true of us as well just stop and think about that for a minute and then it says he is invisible that of course means that he cannot be perceived through our natural vision but it also means that 
although by his spirit and word we can know him and we can know much about him, he is so infinite that there will always be a mystery about who he is. This is my personal opinion. I believe we will have a continual hunger to know God more and more throughout eternity, and we will never be fully satisfied. Why? Because there will always be more of God to absorb, to take in, to learn. How cool is that? Besides me, who can't wait for that? I'm really looking forward to that. And finally, he says that God, the God of the Bible, is the only God. In our world, there are many so-called gods. For example, Hinduism has 330 million gods. But here we get the simple fact that the God of the Bible is the only God. I have some teachings on this on my YouTube channel that speak to the evidence of this, because that's a bold claim. But there is evidence that I believe is insurmountable that the God of the Bible is the true God. But here, Paul is giving the God who saved him the glory he deserves. And now he ends with this final burst of praise to this God. Be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. David Guzik says this, knowing all this about God, Paul couldn't stop praising him. If we ever have trouble worshiping God, it is because we don't know him very well. And his point's clear. The more we know God, the more we will want to praise him. The more amazing we will see that he is. And so that's our takeaway today, our action item that we can practice all through the week. Number one, think about who God is and what he's done for you. And then number two, like Paul, let gratitude rise up in your heart and let that inspire praise to come out of your mouth. I don't know what you're going through right now, but I can guarantee you praise is the pathway through and out. Now to the King Eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen.